Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you this morning. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in Konark, um, but this is second best, but it's better than not being there at all. I wanted to talk to you again today about the same theme that I last discussed when I was invited to Odisha back in November 2017 to the Odisha Knowledge Hub. And I talked about why tourism matters and why in particular responsible tourism matters. Tourism has become the world's largest industry, some argue. I'm not sure that's true, but it is close to 11% of all consumption. And what it reflects, I think, is the growth in disposable income amongst more and more societies. Now, whether that growth is sustainable is really the big challenge facing all of us. So I really want to reflect on that this morning in the context of the main themes that I know you've been discussing um, at the conference this morning. Sustainable development does have a long history. It goes back to 1972 with the Stockholm Conference on Environment and Development, Brundtland Report, and so on. We've known that this problem is developing now for close to 50 years. The most recent formulation of, of what we need to achieve is in the Sustainable Development Goals, which were built on the very successful Millennium Development Goals. But the Millennium Development Goals didn't pay a great deal of attention to the issue of sustainability. We saw very considerable growth in the first 15 years of this century, um, a, a level of growth which I would argue is unsustainable. But the truth is that despite having worried about this issue of sustainability for close to 50 years, with very little to show for it. That's not quite fair because we do have a lot of examples now of ways in which things can be made more sustainable. A problem is that not enough people are implementing them. And I'll illustrate that in a minute. 50 years ago, I was a student at the University of York. We didn't talk about the limits to growth. We didn't talk about the World Commission on Environment and Development, but I did see, because it made the front page of one of the Sunday newspapers, um, the publication by the Club of Rome of Limits to Growth, and I purchased a copy, it's still on my bookshelves. The truth is that I, th I just laughed. I didn't think we would ever be so foolish as a species as to continue with those kinds of rates of growth and the environmental damage and the social and economic damage, which would inevitably res result from that. It's the foolishness of youth, because we certainly did continue in that way. And if you look at tourism, then over tourism is a direct consequence of doing no more than paying lip service to the concept of sustainability. We talk about it all the time, but we don't actually do it. The Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute based at Melbourne University published back in 2014 and updated in 2016, their analysis of what had happened since the Club of Rome report. And it showed how foolish I was to assume back in 2000 and before that was really as 1972 that we would see that we had a problem and that we'd deal with it we haven't and we haven't dealt with the problem we started the responsible tourism awards to follow on from ba's tourism for tomorrow awards which they abandoned or ran for the last time in 2003 we picked them up in 2004 and from the outset we wanted to focus on finding and celebrating examples where individuals, businesses or destinations have taken responsibility. They've seen a problem, they've thought about what they could do about it, they've taken responsibility, made a difference and critically transparently reported what their impact is. And through that process, we found many excellent proven solutions. We've recognised and promoted them to encourage replication but replication has still been disappointingly low. Now I'd want to just remind you of the critical difference between the concept of sustainability, which is an aspiration. It's an idea, it's vague, it's incapable of being measured. And for most people, it is just a good word to use. It's not in any way affecting what they do. Responsibility by contrast is what you actually do to achieve an aspiration. It's something you have to take. It's something you have to do. So we always say that responsibility is about the activity, 
which leads to a sustainable objective. So it's about having a sense of duty to deal with something or having control over something and doing something about it. And, in, and that's the negative sense. That's where blame uh, begins. But it's also about having a sense of self-worth, of empowerment. And these two elements of the definition of responsibility are there in all cultures. It's partly about having duty and having blame, but it's also having a sense of, I could do something about that. Why don't I do something about that? I can make a difference. It's those two things, the positive and the negative, the stick and the carrot that come together. So what is responsible tourism? Responsible travel. It's about minimizing the negative impacts of what we do as consumers and as producers of travel and tourism experiences. It's about generating greater economic benefits for local people, enhancing the well-being of local communities and improving working conditions and access to the industry. We really should aspire to be an equal opportunities employer. And Lemon Tree Hotels is an excellent example in India of a company which has gone a very long way to employ the seriously disadvantaged and those who are differently able. We should endeavor to involve local people in decisions. And that's one of the things which Kerala has done particularly well in India through the Panchayat system. We should also make positive contributions to the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. If we're traveling to a country or traveling within our own country to enjoy someone else's conserved natural or cultural heritage, we should contribute to the cost of doing that on a much bigger scale than we currently do. From an industry perspective, we need to make sure that we're providing enjoyable experiences for tourists, creating for them the meaningful connections with local people, a greater understanding of the cultural and environmental issues. It's that that makes people want to return. They feel a sense of identity with the place. That's certainly one of the reasons that I go back to India. And to be honest, prefer to visit places I already know reasonably well than to just discover new ones. The next is we need to make sure that tourism is inclusive, both in terms of its employment practice and enabling the differently able and the socially disadvantaged to enjoy the same experiences of tourism that we do. And last, but very important, we need to travel in ways which are culturally sensitive and which are based on respect between the tourist and the host. In a sense, this is all just about making tourism better. It's not difficult, but it does require applied effort. And it does require that people take responsibility. Now, I can remember the first time I arrived in India and how excited I was to be there. I was traveling at the time as a tour leader. I subsequently went on briefly to run a tour operation and then to become an academic. But India has been a part of my life since I first visited it in the 1990s. I was late to international travel. But India has remained and remains one of my most precious destinations. And it's one of the places I'm missing most uh, during the travel bans uh, that we're experiencing at the moment. But I became increasingly concerned as I traveled with well-heeled tourists around the world about the ecotourism. And I was worried about ecotourism because it was largely, in my view, based on a myth. This notion that you kill nothing but time, take nothing but pictures and leave nothing for footprints just seemed to me to be completely wrong. If we were going to travel and enjoy these places and we needed to put back, we needed to make an economic contribution, we needed to put back into the places that we were enjoying. And Kialadio um, in Bharatpur in Rajasthan was for me one of the great, and is still one of the great tourism destinations if you want to experience wildlife. It is a fantastic place if you've not been. And I always stayed at the Bag um, in Bharatpur. Again, an example of a cultural heritage um, conservation project, which had resulted in and, and provides absolutely excellent accommodation. There's no com conflict of interest really between good commercial practice and good conservation practice. The two can go together very well. But it was that concern about ecotourism that led me to compete for public money when our Secretary of State then announced that she wanted to have a close look taken at ecotourism. I was skeptical, if I'm honest, and I'm afraid the research that we did, which included Kialadia, demonstrated that ecotourism was very largely a myth. At the system level in the National Park, it was extremely difficult to see the difference between an ecotourist and a traditional tourist. Neither was putting very much back into the conservation of the park. 
But that work, first as a tour operator and tour leader, and then as an academic, and, and, and now working as, a, as an advisor to World Travel Market and others, um, has led on to a rich vein of work for me. And I hope I've made a contribution um, in India and around the world, but particularly impressed by uh, what's going on with Village Ways, for example, and with the Village Life Experiences, which uh, the Responsible Tourism Mission has developed in Kerala, and also the uh, producer groups who've managed to achieve so much of an increase in their standard of living. And it was very um, dramatic, I think, when the Minister of Tourism in Kerala challenged us to demonstrate that. We did with Rupesh Kumar. We undertook a, a, a census level study of the impact of tourism. In, in one village and were able to demonstrate that it was extremely significant. I've had the great pleasure now to travel over much of India. Um, I still don't claim to know the nation very well, but it's certainly um, where I would take my last trip. If I knew I had one last trip to go, it would be to India. Why responsibility then? Well, it's about people taking responsibility, choosing to act. It's about the action. And that action is critical to making change in the world. Responsible tourism is not a product. You shouldn't be using it in our marketing. The tourist should be able to experience the difference. It should be there in their experience of the, the way they travel and of the destination they visit. All forms of tourism can be more responsible. It's not about one particular form of tourism being better than another. Destinations, I'm pleased to see, are increasingly focused on yield. And one of the impacts of COVID going forward is that we're going to see destinations much more focused on what is being, what the gain is from tourism, about using tourism to make better places for people to live in. But at the heart of responsible tourism, as I've said before, is this idea of transparency. The only way that we can counter the greenwashing that goes on in our industry is to make sure that we transparently report what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what the impact of our taking responsibility is. Only thus will we get to sustainability. Now, just very quickly to look at some of the themes that you've been looking at, I understand this morning. We've heard a lot during the COVID lockdowns around the world about the reduction in carbon emissions. Don't believe a word of it. This is the one continuous data set we have. It's from, um, from Hawaii. From the, from the laboratory there, which has been consistently monitoring the percentage of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere um, for close to 40, 50 years. In 2021, it was up at 415 parts per million. In January 2020, it was a mere 413. So it's gone up by two parts per million in a year when there was less economic activity because of COVID. If you want to know what's happening with carbon, that's the place to look for your information. Our plastic waste, we can see this more easily. So we see the pollution. But unfortunately, it's ended up in the deep oceans, in these gyros of pollution, which means in the main, we don't see them. But when you see the kind of pollution we see at the Arctic or under the Antarctic, then you'd be under the, under the Arctic and in Antarctica, you begin to realize how serious the plastic pollution is. And because of that plastic pollution, the geologists will tell us that we've actually entered the Anthropocene. There's so much plastic now in the environment that if there are archaeologists in the future, in a thousand years time, they'll look back on this period and identify it as the period when man begin, began to pollute his environment to such an extent that you name the geological period after us. I wanted to end though by looking at rainwater harvesting, as this is at least a positive example from CGH Earth Hotels in Kerala, Kamarakam, they've got a great system of rainwater harvesting, which means that they don't need to take water from the local community, but they capture it, much of it for themselves uh, through this very beautiful um, lake that they've collected. Responsible tourism has spread across India since we first started to do the awards um, at, in 2004 globally, and then obviously accelerated by running the Responsible Tourism Awards in India, we've now got examples of really good responsible tourism practice across much of the continent, the subcontinent. And it was fantastic to see recently the formal agreement signed between Kerala and Madhya Pradesh and the extension of the program of responsible tourism in a very serious way by the state in Madhya Pradesh. Again, 
building on the work of, of Kerala, but, but learning from them and adapting the processes. And of course, responsible tourism is there in the new national tourism strategy, which is an exciting development. We had a great session at WTM London with, with three um, secretaries of tourism from the different states. Um, the three leading states probably know responsible tourism, led by Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, and Maharashtra, I think going to join um, in the process. I'm hoping too that Odisha and some of the other states are going to join too in this major initiative. I, we've only ever given out five judges awards. Um, two of them have been presented to people in Kerala, one from the private sector, Joe's Dominic, and the other from the Responsible Tourism Mission, Rupesh Kumar, recognizing their contribution at the global level to responsible tourism. The, the, the two have been given out in South Africa and one in Kenya, but it's quite clear that in the that Kerala is a leading example of responsible tourism and that many of the best examples in the world are now coming from India. In 2008, we held the second international conference on responsible tourism in destinations in Kochi with Dr. Venu and really focused on learning what we had managed to find from practice between the first conference in 2002 and the second, which was in Kerala in 2008. We're now up to the 14th International Conference, which was held in the UK, 2018. The next one will be in Finland, uh, possibly this year, but more likely, I think, in 2022, when it's possible for people to travel again. What we're doing this year at World Travel Market is developing a draft platform for responsible tourism focused on the solutions that we've identified. That will be formally launched in November at WTM London. We're going to be discussing it through the year. That platform will then run through 2022 to the November 2022 uh, World Travel Market in London, where we'll be reflecting on 20 years of responsible tourism. And I'm hoping that Kerala and Madhya Pradesh will be there, along with many other companies and states from India, to learn from each other about what's been achieved and how we accelerate progress in the decade through to 2030. Thank you for listening. It's been a real pleasure to be with you today, even if not physically present. I would just like to end by congratulating all those who've won um, awards this year. It really was a very impressive uh, round of, um, of applications and, and very worthy with us. So congratulations to you all. Enjoy your success and then go on to do more. Thank you for listening.